Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Grand Rounds. Our guest speakers are gonna be two uh, of our physicians in the pulmonary section uh, currently, and um, uh, both of them are interventional pulmonologists. Uh, one of them is uh, Dr. David Becknell, who did his training at uh, Gainesville, uh, both for, uh, for pulmonary and also for his interventional uh, pulmonary additional year. And the other one is Dr. Ramsey Abdel Ghani. And Ramsey uh, was with us for his fellowship and then went to Harvard for an additional year. Uh, lucky for us, both of them have deep roots in Louisiana and so uh, returned to us to keep our program going. You know, one of the things I should mention is that the interventional pulmonary program here at Tulane has been one of the first ones uh, in the country and has been going strong for 25 years. And in fact, some of the uh, breadth of the interventional procedures that they can do to help our patients, uh, you, you would have to drive uh, five to eight hours uh, in order to, uh, to do uh, what uh, this team is going to uh, uh, present to you today. So uh, today's uh, presentation then uh, by this uh, dynamic duo uh, will give you a, a picture of what is available here uh, in our region uh, of the Gulf South uh, to assist with the care of your patients. So without further ado, uh, I, I give you two outstanding interventional pulmonologists to present to you today the cadre of, uh, of procedures that they're able to do. Great. Uh, I think I'll start first. And thank you, Dr. Lasky, for the introduction. And I think on behalf of myself and Dr. Becknell, we're both very excited to be able to uh, tell you a little bit of what we do. Can you all guys hear me and see me okay? Yes. All right, great. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have nothing to disclose. Uh, first, to kind of tell you a little bit of background, what is interventional pulmonology? It's kind of a newer subspecialty. Uh, interventional is in the name, so you'd assume correctly that it's a procedural-based uh, subspecialty, subspecialty, excuse me. Uh, it has minimally invasive procedures that we do aimed at diagnosing various respiratory diseases and malignancy. And we also employ uh, many advanced diagnostic and therapeutic bronchoscopic and uh, plural techniques to, get, uh, to achieve these goals. And how do you get to interventional pulmonology? Well, like most medicine-based subspecialties, you go through three years of internal medicine, then you do another three years of uh, pulmonary and critical care, then you go back for more and do an additional seventh year uh, in interventional pulmonology. This is some of the diseases we treat. It's not everything, but it's a good representation. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the way to have a good IP program and a strong IP program is to have a strong lung cancer program. We, a lot of our, our techniques are aimed at diagnosing and treating lung cancer and, and, and all the issues associated with that. We also have a, a wide array of expertise uh, uh, treating severe COPD and other benign diseases, persistent asthma, uh, tracheobronchomalacia, and a wide array, array of uh, fistulas, ranging from tracheoesophageal fistulas and bronchopleural fistulas. We're also uh, trained at treating uh, submassive and massive hemoptysis, able to isolate the bleeding lung and, uh, and ventilate the non-bleeding lung and help the patient uh, navigate that safely. We're also able to diagnose a wide array of interstitial lung diseases via uh, a multitude of different kinds of biopsy. And we have a wide uh, array of expertise in plural diseases, plural fusions, plural infections, masses, and managing uh, pneumothoraces. So some of the tools that we can use and some of our toys, uh, you guys are probably very familiar with the flexible bronchoscope pictured here. You can see my mouse. Uh, we also have a second uh, bronchoscope called a rigid bronchoscope, and essentially it's just a uh, steel pipe that has a larger working channel and allows us to, mul to employ multiple tools at the same time. Uh, we also use a navigational bronchoscopy, and basically that's just a, a lung GPS system. It kind of helps us navigate and know where the uh, peripheral lung lesion is, able to safely uh, navigate to it and biopsy it. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with the word uh, EBIS or endobronchial ultrasound. That is using a flexible bronchoscope with an ultrasound at the end of it that allows us to, uh, to biopsy uh, uh, mediastinal and hyalurid lymph, uh, lymph nodes and uh, proximal lung masses. Uh, 
We're also going to talk about endobronchial valves a little later. And for our pleural service, we also are able to use uh, chest tubes, thoracic TCs, tunnel pleural catheters, and uh, medical thoracoscopy. So I'll talk briefly about a rigid bronchoscope. This is what it looks like. It's basically, like I mentioned earlier, a steel pipe. It's got a large inner working channel and allows us to uh, use a multitude of different tools at the same time to be able to do a procedure more effectively. Essentially what happens is the anesthesiologist will, place the, will uh, put the patient to sleep and paralyze the patient. And we go in and we intubate the patient with the rigid bronchoscope and ventilate through the rigid bronchoscope. And we're able to do our, a lot of our procedures that way. Some of the benefits of having a rigid bronchoscope are able to extract foreign bodies. Again, as I alluded to earlier, to manage massive hemoptysis by isolating the bleeding lung and, uh, and ventilating the non-bleeding lung. That way we're able to, uh, to treat the patient better. Again, we have multiple different uh, modalities that we can employ through the rigid bronchoscope. A laser, cryotherapy, balloon dilation. We can also place and remove uh, larger airway stents. Uh, some more of the advantages and kind of to tell you the difference between the two kinds of bronchoscopes. We have uh, the inner, the flexible bronchoscope has a smaller uh, outer, outer diameter compared to the rigid bronchoscope and a much smaller inner diameter. Uh, because of that, suction capability is much better on a rigid bronchoscope. So if a uh, patient has a large mucus plug, a foreign body, or massive hemoptysis, the rigid bronchoscope really is the, the way to go. We're also able to use multiple tools at the same time, as opposed to have only, uh, using only one tool in the flexible bronchoscope. And both can be used under general anesthesia, but the rigid bronchoscope can, uh, cannot be used under moderate sedation. So some of our ablation techniques, if you have a, 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 uh, a, uh, a tumor or a lesion obstructing the airway, we have ways to, uh, to core that out and, and to, to remove that. One of them is uh, argon plasma coagulation. Essentially, it's a catheter that's fed through the working channel of either bronchoscope, and it, it uh, <clears throat> sprays a argon gas, which, which then gets hit by electricity and causes a, uh, becomes plasma, essentially. And depending on the temperature of the plasma, depending on how much electricity you're giving it, you can do it a wide array of uh, tissue effect on the lesion, ranging from hyperthermia, just warming it up, to coagulation, stopping bleeding and such, or vaporization, just ablating the entire tissue altogether. And this is it kind of in effect. You can see the catheter kind of shooting out to the tissue. Next, we have uh, another tool we like to use, uh, laser. There are many different kinds of laser, uh, lasers that we use. However, basically they all do the same thing. Depending, uh, depending on how uh, close they are to the lesion or to the tissue, they can either coagulate or ablate. If you're a little farther away, you'll get a good coagulation effect, but the closer you get to the tissue, the more ablative the laser becomes. Now, changing over to a, a more mechanical cold therapy that we have is something called the uh, cryoprobe. And what this is, you can see on the bottom of your screen, is a, is a gold-plated uh, probe. And what that does is it uh, uses the Jules-Thompson effect, and which is rapidly expanding gas, causes a rapid decrease in temperature. And that can uh, essentially freeze anything that has, wa that has uh, water associated with it. So it can freeze airway. It can also freeze uh, tissue and lesion. So we use that essentially to debride, debulk, or biopsy different uh, kinds of tissue. It's important to us because the traditional forceps does a very, has a lot of tearing involved in it, which can cause um, crush artifact and tissue destruction. The cryoprobe is nice that it can preserve tissue architecture. Additionally, the uh, severe cold or extreme cold can cause microthrombi and decrease the risk of bleeding when you use cryobiopsy. Another uh, less elegant but very effective uh, modality of, of taking out a central airway obstruction is usually using the rigid bronchoscope to just core. And what that it entails is you can see here, there's a, a large tracheal mass that's almost nearly, nearly occluding the uh, airway. And you can imagine this is a, uh, an emergency. So we can go in and use the bevel of the rigid bronchoscope to essentially core out and take out the lesion. Using forceps, we can remove the lesion and we place the rigid bronchoscope in that area for a few minutes, and the actual barrel of the rigid bronchoscope can tampon on the bleeding. And here you can see it's good effect. The uh, main carina, left main stem, and right main stem are, are, are widely patent, and there's, uh, we've achieved hemostasis. So I'll talk a little bit about airway obstruction. There are three kinds. Uh, the first kind, uh, as you can see in the picture here, is intrinsic airway obstruction. 
and basically that the lesion is confined predominantly or completely to the uh, inside of the airway. And there's no involvement of the airway wall or outside of the airway. Essentially what we, how we approach these patients is we go in and we debulk the tumor, take a look around, and assuming uh, once we achieve hemostasis, the patient is uh, treated. Next is a extrins or an ex extrinsic compression, and that basically is a lesion uh, pressing from the outside, causing significant narrowing on the uh, airway lumen. Another thing we can do here, here uh, debulking, it becomes a lot uh, more challenging. It's, it's not as easy. And what we normally do is use a balloon to dilate the area. And if the narrowing persists after balloon dilation, we can place an, an airway stent to keep that open. The patient then goes for definitive treatment of uh, the, uh, the uh, etiology or the, the the, the primary cause, and once uh, that lesion is shrunk or gone, we can go ahead, come back and remove the stent. And the third kind of airway obstruction is a mixed airway obstruction, which is basically a little, a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Where this becomes a little more challenging to approach, you have to do some significant debulking, make sure you, you maintain the integrity of the airway wall, and usually have to place a stent to keep the tumor or lesion from growing back in. And again, once they get definitive treatment, we go back in, and if the, if the obstruction is re resolved, we uh, remove the stent. And these are a few of the kinds of uh, stents that we employ. They're, many, they're made of many different materials, silicone, metals, nitinol, and the different sizes, different uh, gauges, different dura uh, durometers, and have, have different radial forces. On the, on the left, if you can see my mouse cursor in A, is a silicone stent. It has uh, studding to decrease the chance of migration. And if you go for uh, uh, letter D, is a, is a metal stent made of nitinol. And this is partially covered, where you can see here, uh, has two ends that are uncovered, and this end and in the middle is covered. And that can help uh, tumor growing back in, and the, uh, the uncovered areas can help uh, with, with fixing the, the stent in place. So I want to talk about a case that I had uh, last year during fellowship in Boston. We had a gentleman who came in from an outside hospital. He had a significant smoking history, but otherwise no past medical history. He stated he felt worsening shortness of breath till one day he, couldn't, uh, he wasn't breathing very well. They got a chest x-ray at the outside hospital shown here, and he was transferred to our hospital for interventional pulmonology uh, evaluation. You can see here the right hemithorax is completely occluded and obstructed. So we got a CAT scan when he came over here. And this is a, the CAT scan, the coronal view of the CAT scan. And you can see there's significant obstruction on the right side where the right main stem, this is called the cutoff sign where you can see basically the airway ends, the lumen of the airway ends. And so there's something there obstructing, whether it be mucus, blood, or tumor. We ended up taking the patient to, the, to a rigid bronchoscopy. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, these, these images did not come out as well as I'd like them to, I think. They came from our uh, bronch report. It just wasn't as clear as I wanted it to be. But for orientation, this is the main carina right here in the middle. And this is the left main stem, and here's the right main stem. And if I'll explain what it is, it's not easy to see. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, blood clot and a large mass in the right main stem, including the, the distal parts of the right lung. So we, net, uh, we, we basically debulked and cored out the tumor, took it out achieved hemostasis and placed a metallic covered stent. And this is, these are like the chain links of the metallic stent. And you can see distal to the obstruction, the airway was uninvolved. So it did seem it was a tumor coming from the right main stem, blocking off the entire right lung. And once removed, the lung uh, expanded quite well. And here again is the main carina, the left main stem and the right main stem going to the right lung with the stent in place. And this is a chest x-ray after the uh, procedure. So you can see a significant difference. Patient felt much better. He was able to be extubated and he went home to go, undergo treatment. This is a new, a new diagnosis of uh, adenocarcinoma. So the, the patient does feel better when they go home, but we had to, they, they did some trials back in the late 90s. Dr. Henry Colt, one of the fathers of interventional pulmonology, and uh, it was a retrospective review on some cases that he had done for central airway obstruction. Essentially, patients came in on mechanical ventilation because one, one or, you know, a lot, they had a significant airway obstruction and required uh, mechanical ventilation for respiratory failure. He went in and did a therapeutic rigid bronchoscopy, 
and he found that almost two thirds of those patients had immediate discontinu discontinuation of the ventilator after the procedure. As you can imagine, one lung wasn't being used and he was able to open up that lung. Additionally, about half of those patients were immediately transferred to a low level of care after intervention. So they, they came in the ICU, underwent the procedure, was, were extubated and went down to the floor. And uh, in 2006, uh, there was another study that showed central airway obstruction was specifically looking at non-small cell lung cancer. And they had 144 patients total. They uh, put into two different groups. One group had, uh, sorry, a third of them had central airway obstruction. So they divided them into having standard of care, which is just chemotherapy, and chemotherapy plus bronchoscopy. Because I know I'm an ICU doctor as well. When I see these patients with metastatic disease, you, you want to talk about palliative care and hospice care. And you can imagine patients with one of the lungs completely obstructed aren't going to live very long or do very well and likely not going to come out of the ICU. So they found that after doing these procedures on these patients, both groups lived to be about the same. So essentially the patient with no airway obstruction under undergoing chemotherapy lived on an average of 8.4 months back in 2006. And the patient who had central airway obstruction was on a ventilator, was much sicker after bronchoscopy, also lived on average around 8.4 months. So in patients with this, having respiratory uh, uh, decompensation, we can go in and sometimes make things a little better. So to switch over to more, a little more on uh, benign disease, uh, I want to talk a little bit about tracheal stenosis. It can happen from uh, a multitude of different ways. We're going to start seeing more and more of these after, uh, during, because of the COVID era. Uh, and one of the most common causes of this is uh, post-intubation tracheal stenosis. Another uh, common cause, which we will see again because of COVID, is post-tracheostomy tracheal stenosis. Some of the less common way, uh, reasons you can have these diseases is uh, chronic infection, rheumatological disease, or not otherwise specified. We don't know why. It's idiopathic stenosis. And they're graded into four different ways, usually by the, gauge, the amount of obstruction. So 0 to 50%, 51 to 70% is grade 2, grade 3 is 71 to 99%, and complete obstruction is uh, grade 4. This is a case, again, I, uh, one of my patients that we had in the past. He uh, essentially came in progressively short of breath, had a significant strider. And these patients, if they have a, a uh, airway lumen of less than eight millimeters, normally they'll have symptoms with exertion. And if they have an airway lumen less than five millimeters, they'll have symptoms at rest. And this patient had a lumen of maybe two to three millimeters. To kind of orient you guys, this is the, these are the vocal folds and the vocal cords. And this is a subglottic space about five millimeters to one centimeter under the vocal cords. So essentially how we approach these patients is we use electrocautery knife and heat therapy and we make three radial cuts to, uh, to ensure a uh, controlled tear. Then we take a balloon and we dilate that area and we try to you know, maintain that patency. This is a picture of uh, the balloon so via our bronchoscope. Uh, this is, so this is kind of underwater view because the balloon is filled with saline. So as our camera flush against the balloon and you can see through to the, to the balloon actually opening up the airway. And there's some, some blanching, knowing that we're, you know, we're, we're expanding the balloon adequately, but not so much that there's tearing or ripping. And this is the end result after uh, balloon electrocautery and balloon dilation. And these patients go on to do, do quite well most of the time. A lot of patients we have, they come in every year or so, whenever they start feeling more symptomatic, we do a quick balloon dilation, electrocautery, and then they go back home and they go on the same day and you know, living their lives. However, if this, is, if this becomes complicated or our, our, you know, our modalities are ineffective, the real gold standard is a surgical reconstruction and resection of, of the tracheal lesion. And usually our ENT colleagues or our thoracic surgeon, surgery colleagues do those procedures. This is another case that Dr. Becknell had at, uh, at Tulane. I believe this was a post-COVID uh, intubation. And after she was extubated, she had significant strider. Again, this is the, the glottis, and this is a significant portion of a large piece of granulation tissue right at the opening of the vocal cords. Dr. Becknell removed it and achieved hemostasis, and afterwards it was quite open and patent. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, severe emphysema and COPD and uh, lung volume reduction. So there was a, 
back, back when severe emphysema had, you know, basically the patient has a lot of uh, trapped air. And essentially the way I think about it, it's like a, uh, a useless roommate. You see he's, he's there taking up space, not paying rent, not doing anything. So this air is sitting there, not participating in gas exchange, and the patient isn't able to take a, a, a very deep breath because of it. So having, achieving lung volume reduction would reduce mismatching, improve the elastic recoil and the patient's symptoms. It also improves the mechanics of the diaphragm and the patient's intercostals. And it can also decrease into thoracic pressure, improving uh, cardiac index. So they first started doing this with uh, surgical resection. They would, take, they would find the area that had the least gas exchange that wasn't really contributing much to the patient's well-being and surgically removing that area. Unfortunately, these patients do have severe COPD and they're not great surgical candidates. So they found that they had a high short-term mortality, about 8% within the first three months, and up to 60% 60, 60 of patients had significant morbidity. And really sick patients had even more increased mortality in these higher risk patients. So there was, people tried to develop endoscopic lung volume reduction. And what this essentially is, is uh, we go in with the bronchoscope and employ endobronchial valves to reduce uh, essentially lung volume. Uh, this had decreased morbidity and mortality when compared to surgery, as ideally for the high-risk high risk surgical candidates, the ones that can't go to surgery. The great thing about it is, is it's reversible. If the patient doesn't feel better or is having complications after the procedure, you remove the valves and the patient goes back to the way he was. The, the, the lobe reinflates and no harm, no foul. It does require uh, general anesthesia. And it, it, again, it's not without complication. In, the, in all the studies they, they uh, did, it showed that patients had up to a 25% chance of pneumothorax in the first 72 hours. So whenever we do this procedure, we keep the patient in the first uh, we keep the patient in the hospital for 72 hours to monitor for a chance of pneumothorax. This is what they look like. So these are endobronchial valves. Essentially, they're uh, segmental or low bar one-way valves. They allow air out of the lung, but not in. So what that is, every time the patient exhales, air goes out of that lobe, but doesn't go back in when they inhale. And that promotes complete atelectasis of the targeted lobe, achieving lung volume reduction. Two companies make endobronchial valves. One is a Zephyr valve, and one is the uh, spiration valve. So the inclusion criteria for patients with lung for, you know, who are candidates for lung volume reduction, is they have to be symptomatic. So you need the MMR MMRC more than or equal to two. Uh, you want the FAV1, you want them to be sick, but not too sick. You want the FAV1 to be between 15 and 45% predicted. You want, to you want them to have trapped air. So you want the residual volume more than at least one to 75% predicted and a total lung capacity more than 100% predicted, and a DLC of more than 20% predicted. You also want them to exhaust all conventional medical therapy. They should have completed pulmonary rehab and should be maximized on medical therapy before being considered for this procedure. And this is essentially how we do it. We, uh, we employ a catheter once we find the target lobe. We use uh, the loader system and the delivery catheter. I wanna show you a quick video, I'll pause it, what they look like. I just want to comment, uh, this is not me doing the bronchoscope. This is the general pulmonary fellow after we had placed the endobronchial valves. So uh, these bronch bronchoscopy skills are not reflective of me or, or David. <laughs> so you can see these little valves in there. And every time the patient exhales and air comes out of the lung, they open. So I'm going to show it to you again. It's kind of interesting. And then eventually you promote, as the patient exhales over time, they promote atelectasis and lobar collapse. So here's a coronal CT of a patient at the time of, uh, at the, time of the uh, valve placement to six weeks after and 12 weeks after. So you can see it's a coronal view of a, of a CAT scan. The patient has severe emphysemous disease, uh, mainly in the upper lung zones. Uh, via a, uh, a computer software we use and talking to the patient, we selected to do the right upper lobe. We placed endobronchial valves in the right upper lobe, and six weeks after, you can see there's some partial atelectasis. And then after three months, there's complete lobar collapse. The patient had symptomatic improvement. He was able to go to the bathroom on his own, care for himself, take a bath by himself, and for him, that was, that was everything. Another uh, use for uh, endobronchial valves is a persistent air leak. Now, if you have a pneumothorax and you place a chest tube, and the chest tube 
And so the pneumothorax isn't healing on its own. After five or seven days, this is classified as a persistent air leak. What we can do is we can employ uh, endobronchial valves as well to stop the leak of air. This is an interesting patient we had in, uh, when I was in fellowship. He got microwave ablation for a right upper lobe pulmonary nodule by interventional radiology. Very cool technology. Obviously, some of the uh, some of the risk factors would be pneumothorax. So we, what we do is we go in and the patient has a blowing uh, air leak on the chest tube, and we inflate a uh, a balloon, and, and wherever. You know, if, if we're thinking it's a right upper, uh, right upper lobe, we inflate the balloon in the right upper lobe, and if the leak stops, then we know the leak is coming from the right upper lobe. We monitor the chest tube and make sure at least you have 50% decrease in the leak after 30 seconds to a minute. And these are the endo endobronchial valves. We placed spiration valves in this patient, and uh, you can see them sitting well in the uh, segments of the right upper lobe. And the, and the patient did well. And so what happens six weeks later, after the, the defect is healed, we come back and we take the valves out. The lung re-expands and the patient goes back to normal. So the last thing I wanna talk about, but not least, is uh, interstitial lung diseases. These are very, very challenging to diagnose. We have the fortune of having one of the world's experts with Dr. Lasky uh, helping you know, diagnose all these patients and, have, and being so involved with pulmonary fibrosis. They do really require a multidisciplinary approach. You need an expert pathologist, an expert pulmonologist, and an expert thoracic radiologist. If all these are still not sufficient to, uh, to diagnose the disease, you, the, the patients usually go for surgical lung biopsy, and that is the gold standard and still is. Surgical lung biopsy is great. You get a, a ton of tissue. It retains a tissue architecture, so the pathologist can accurately and confidently make the interstitial lung disease diagnosis. However, it is a surgical procedure, and these patients are sick. They have significant lung disease. So there's also a significant morbidity and mortality in the, uh, uh, when performing this, uh, this uh, procedure. You can, some of the complications, uh, you can have a pneumothorax and prolonged air leak. Uh, pretty commonly, you can have pain at the surgical site. Uh, like any sterile procedure, you can have infection at the site and uh, exacerbation of their inherent lung disease. You can also have a two to 4% chance of death. So in the interest of being more and more or less and less invasive, uh, people started using the cryoprobe though I, I mentioned earlier to take uh, large, larger uh, tissue biopsies. Not, not as large as surgical lung biopsy, but larger than our traditional trans bronchial forcep biopsies. And this is the cryoprobe just freezing water. And here's a cryoprobe freezing uh, tissue. So essentially how we do the procedure is under fluoroscopic guidance, we uh, extend the cryoprobe to the periphery of the lung, freeze for a few seconds, and pull. And this gives us a nice piece of tissue. And this is a great representative slide. I love this slide. It kind of tells all the three differences between surgical lung biopsy on the left, cryobiopsy in the middle, and transbronchial biopsy with small forceps on the right. Now transbronchial biopsy is the safest. It has the least risk but because of the small biopsy and the crush artifact of the actual ripping of the uh, forceps, it has a lower accuracy. As I mentioned, surgical lung biopsy has the highest accuracy because it's the most tissue, it pr greatly preserves uh, uh, lung architecture, but does have the highest risk. The goal of cryobiopsy is to have a lower risk than surgical lung biopsy and be more accurate than transbronchial forcep biopsy. And these are representative pieces. They're about five millimeters to a centimeter in length. And depending on your interstitial lung disease expert and your pathologist, your, your lung pathologist, it, uh, cryobiopsy can be very useful in helping diagnose these patients. So that uh, concludes my half of the talk. If you uh, want to want to contact any one of us, have any referrals, any questions, if there's a patient you think we can you know, can benefit from uh, them seeing us or something something we can help with. This is my cell phone, my email, and Dr. Becknell's cell phone and email. This is the email of our uh, interventional pulmonology nurse and the number of our interventional, interventional pulmonary clinic at Tulane. So again, thank you for your time, and I appreciate the uh, chance to talk. Thanks, Ramsey. Before uh, we introduce Dr. Becknell or before he takes over, uh, I, I just forgot to mention that if you have questions, uh, put them into the Q&A uh, part of, on your, uh, your screen and then we'll get to the questions at the end. All right, Dr. Becknell. So let me stop. Thank you. Please.
So I'm going to pick, all, pick up with some more different procedures that we're able to do with interventional pulmonary. The first thing I want to talk about, though, is lung cancer, because although interventional pulmonary can apply to a multitude of different pulmonary conditions, one of the main focuses is diagnosing and treating lung cancer. And I kind of want to emphasize how important this is. Lung cancer, although it's the second most common uh, cancer in both men and women in the United States, it's the leading cause of cancer deaths in both men and women in the United States. And this year, the estimate is that about 135,000 deaths will be related to lung cancer in the United States. The good news, though, as you can see from these graphs on the right, is that the death rate from lung cancer is actually going down. The overall death rate from malignancy in the top graph you can see is declining over time. But in the second graph by males, the red line is lung cancer. And you can see that's declining. And then also in females, death rate by uh, lung cancer is also declining. And there's a multitude of reasons why this is happening. One of the main re drivers is that less and less people are smoking. And, um, but we're also doing additional things on top of that. We're diagnosing lung cancer early. We've implemented low dose screening CTs. And then also the treatment of lung cancer has really changed radically in the last few years as we have more targeted therapy. Kind of as I talked about earlier, why this is so important. Um, traditionally, lung cancer has been diagnosed later when it's been metastatic. And you can see that 57% are traditionally diagnosed with metastatic disease already present. And the unfortunate thing about that is the mortality associated with these patients is already very high. And they have about a 5% five-year survival. But if we can catch them and diagnose them when they only have localized disease, their five-year survival is much better. And a key tool we use for this is lung cancer screening CT. And as much, most of you probably know at this point, the, L, the LTST trial did demonstrate that there was a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality in former smokers with a 30-pack year or current smokers in the lung, uh, who who are currently smoking or people who quit in the last 15 years when you did screening CTs versus chest x-ray, which is a big uh, impact as far as mortality. And I think all this goes to emphasize the importance um, of diagnosing lung cancer early. And the goal of interventional pulmonary and pulmonary in this uh, aspect is to diagnose lung cancer as early as possible in a minimally invasive way and decrease the number of procedures and complications. And I'm gonna talk about a few of the tools we use to do this. Uh, Ramsey talked about some of this earlier, but let me just go into a little bit more depth. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is the EBUS scope that you're most familiar with, the linear EBUS. I'll also talk about radial EBUS, and then I'll talk a little bit about navigation bronchoscopy, cone beam CT, and then also kind of the future where we're going with diagnosing lung cancer, uh, robotic bronchoscopy. So this is a picture of a linear EBUS scope. You can see the scope here if you see my mouse. And at the end of the scope is this portion of the scope, which is actually an ultrasound probe. You have an ultrasound probe so you can see what you're biopsying. There is a camera on the end of the scope, and then there's also a working channel. And you can see through that working channel, a needle can actually come out, and you can see where that needle is in real time while you're biopsying. The second picture also has a uh, balloon that's inflated on the end of the scope, and that just helps get a better ultrasound image by coupling the scope to the airway better. And you can see on this second set of pictures, there's a lymph node in the middle of the chest, and then you can see under uh, ultrasound guidance, you can see the lymph node with the needle in it, and you can avoid structures such, such as vasculature. And this has improved the dramatic, uh, dramatically the yield of uh, diagnosing and staging lung cancer. So like we talked about, and like most people are familiar with, um, EBUS is employed to stage lymph nodes and diagnose lymph nodes in the center of the chest. And you can see this image to the left shows a multitude of the lymph nodes that we're able to reach. And the good news about this is the diagnosis rate and the sensitivity of lymph node staging is very high. It approaches mediastinoscopy and it actually can reach out further into the airways and reach more lymph nodes and also do it less invasively. Another use of linear EBUS 
is to diagnose centrally located lung nodules and masses. Um, you are limited how far you can go distally into the airway with the scope because of the size of the scope is about six millimeters. Um, another common use of an EBA scope is to diagnose benign conditions such as sarcoidosis. And it's pretty good at diagnosing sarcoidosis and it also can diagnose lymphoma. So this is just an example case of a use of um, linear EBUS. This was an elderly female who had bilateral lung nodules. As you can see here, she has this lung nodule in her right lower lobe, and then this one along the fissure in the left lower lobe. And you can see that the right lower lobe lung nodule is very close to the airway, the bronchus intermedius in the right lower lobe. And um, you can see on PET that both of these lesions are PET avid. We were able to get to this lung nodule here. You can see the lung nodule here, and you can see the EBUS uh, needle within the lung nodule. And we were able to diagnose her with metastatic um, breast cancer. So while the linear EBUS scope is extremely useful, there is a limit to how far out in the lungs it can get. And if our goal is to diagnose lung cancer as early as possible, I'm gonna talk about some technologies we use to stretch our, diagnose, our diagnostic reach further and further out into the lung to hopefully diagnose earlier and smaller lung cancers. And as we do low dose screening CTs and CTs for a multitude of reasons, we pick up large number of lung nodules and it's really important to get tissue often in these high-risk lung nodules so that we can diagnose uh, cancer or even benign conditions. Traditionally, um, lung nodules have kind of had three options as far as biopsy. Um, bronchoscopic biopsy, which I will talk about. CT-guided transthoracic needle aspiration is another avenue to diagnose lung nodules, especially more peripheral lung nodules. Um, done by interventional radiology, and of course, surgical biopsy can also be performed. But I'm going to concentrate on the uh, bronchoscopic aspect. So as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, there's two types of ultrasound that we use for uh, bronchoscopic um, biopsy. This is a radial uh, ultrasound probe, and you can see on this first picture, this is the end of a normal bronchoscope. And this is the working channel here. And then outside of the working channel is extended a catheter. And then outside of that catheter is extended this radial ultrasound probe. And this radial ultrasound probe has crystals in it that spin and give us a, a circumferential view of what surrounds the probe. And the good thing about that, as you can see on this image on the right, is you can extend this catheter and probe into the periphery of the lung. And if there is a lung nodule there, you'll know it because you'll see this radial ultrasound image. And this is a uh, lung nodule, and this is more typical normal lung to the right. And kind of as I was mentioned earlier, this little indicator here is the edge of the catheter. And the good thing, you, the, the good thing about this is you can extend that probe and not lose your position, you take out the radial ultrasound probe and you're left with the empty catheter and then you can do biopsy of that lesion without moving. So the uses of this um, that I mentioned is number one, biopsying lung lesions and nodules. It also can be used more centrally to look at the depth of penetration of central tumors. So, while the radial ultrasound probe can confirm if you are in a lung nodule, um, one of the tough things is how do you drive the bronchoscope past where you can see and past where the bronchoscope can traditionally reach? And one of the uh, technologies we use is electromagnetic navigation. And I'm going to show you a little schematic here just to give you the basis of this. And the way this works basically is that an electromagnetic field is generated. And then you have, um, on the end of your scope, it is tip tracked, and you can know where in the fill, where in the field, excuse me, you are. And it basically triangulates that location with markers on the patient's chest that account for the respiratory movement of the patient and tell you where in space you are. So the way that traditionally works is the patient gets a CT of their chest, 
And then the pulmonologist goes through the CT with the software from one of the two major companies that does this and um, locates the nodule. And then on that CT, basically you look for a pathway to get there, an airway to get there. Um, and then after you do all of that planning, then it comes time for the bronch. So this isn't live um, guidance, this is virtual guidance. So what you do after you do the CT and you locate the nodule is the patient has um, sensors on his chest, like I mentioned, and then the patient is usually intubated and then the bronchoscopy part of the procedure is performed. And the way this works is it localizes the lesion in space um, by the marker of your tip track and you try to drive that out into this virtual lung nodule, as you can see here, marked in green. And these are some of the tools we use for this. There's needles that can be tip tracked, brushes that can be tip tracked, and also biopsy forces that, forceps that can be tip tracked. The other thing you can see in this picture is these curved catheters. And the advantage of these curved catheters is very similar to like an interventional cardiologist would use, is using these pre-curved catheters, what you can hopefully do is make turns past where you can see with the bronchoscope. Unfortunately, this does have some limitations. This, um, the, the number one limitation is basically the lung nodule that you're driving to is a virtual lung nodule. It's not based off of anything real time. It's based off of a prior CT. Um, and there can be a lot of divergence of where that lung nodule is located. When the patient gets the CT, they do a full inspiratory hold and that lung nodule is in a certain position. But when we do the bronchoscopy, the patient has an endotracheal tube, is sedated, and is um, often having instruments and bronchoscopes pass through the, through the working channel of the, the scope and through the endotracheal tube. And that changes the dynamics of the respiratory motion of that patient and also where in space that lesion is. The other things you'll see is that when the patient is intubated, often there's atelectasis. And the atelectasis can also change where the lung nodule is in relation to space. And then the other thing that often happens is when you pass instruments out through the uh, airways, they can malform the airways and change the position. So how can we take this a step further? And how can we get real-time guidance? And this, this is the technology that is more on the cutting edge as far as biopsying peripheral lung uh, nodules. This gives us that um, confirmatory confirmation in real time. And what you can see on the left is uh, what looks like a C-arm and it can function as a C-arm. That's the cone beam CT. And basically what that can do is spin 360 around the patient and give you a CT image so that you can confirm where you are in space and that you're actually in the lung nodule. So this is something we're currently doing at Tulane. So this is a case of a VA patient who had about a 1.6 centimeter left lower lobe lung nodule. Um, this lung nodule was growing, but on PET scan, it was not avid. But the suspicion given its appearance and its growth and the patient's history and smoking status was this lung nodule was highly concerning for malignancy. So uh, I brought this patient to Tulane to do a cone beam CT. And the way that works is you use electromagnetic navigation off of this prior CT to try to get as close to this nodule as you can. And then after you confirm that with radial EBUS, um, your location, you extend a needle out into the lesion. And then what you do is you're able to spin around the patient 360 degrees with the cone beam. And then that gives you this fluoroscopic image on the right. And it's just one single spin, which is different from conventional CT. And you can see here the bronchoscope extending to the left, lower lobe, and then you can see the edge catheter extending towards the lesion. And then you can actually faintly make out the needle and the lung nodule. And this takes about four to eight seconds. And then what we're left with is a, a CT image. And you can see here on the left, this is the coronal view of the CT. And you can actually see the lung nodule. And then this bright white line is actually the needle located within the lung nodule. So it's giving us real-time confirmation that we are where we think we are. 
So basically, what you do after you get the CT image is you confirm that you're located within the lung nodule in all three pain planes, and you mark the lung nodule. And then another advantage it gives you is then what you are able to do is augmented fluoroscopy. And this is actually the fluoroscopy image that's live while you're biopsying. And you can see the software outlines the lung nodule in three different planes, and you can see your needle passing within the lung nodule. And the other great advantage about this is you don't have to stick to this AP plane. If you have a better plane because of the position of the nodule, you can rotate the fluoro and the software will change the orientation of the nodule based on where the uh, C arm is in space. So this is, from our experience here, has dramatically increased our yield on diagnostic, um, diagnosing lung nodules. The other advantage of this is if you're not in the right position, what you can use is this, um, this outline of the lung nodule, although you can't see this particular lung nodule on fluoro, you have this marker and you can re-navigate and try to get into this lesion um, again, even if the navigation software doesn't precisely get you there. So a little bit of early data on the diagnostic yield of cone bean CT as a supplement to diagnosing peripheral lung nodules. So unfortunately, conventional bronchoscopy does not have a very good yield um, by itself without all these adjunctive technologies in diagnosing lung nodules. And there is quite a range, but the reported range is somewhere between 14 and 63%. With the uh, with the advent of electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, that yield has increased to around 65%. And then a recent study published out of North Carolina in a series of about 90 lung nodules show that when you couple electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy, cone beam CT, and then that augmented fluoroscopy that I was showing you previously, the yield comes up significantly to around 84%. And that's pretty consistent with what we have been seeing here also. One question I get often asked about cone beam CT is what is the radiation dose? So um, you can see here a traditional CTA done for a PE protocol in the ED. The radiation dose is about 15 millisievert. Um, a CT guided transthoracic needle aspiration, which an interventional radiologist would do to diagnose a lung nodule, is about 14 millisievert. So studies have shown that doing cone beam CT guided bronchoscopy can have a little bit of a range of um, radiation exposure. And it depends a little bit on the technique of the bronchoscopist and how many scans they need to do to localize the lung nodule. And it also depends a little bit on the company that's making the cone beam CT. And in studies with the Philips uh, cone beam CT, the radiation dose has been significantly less, 4.5 millisievert. And then the Simmons cone beam CT in the study showed about 10.3 millisievert was the radiation dose. So whether the radiation dose is somewhere between 4 and 10, it is not significantly more and is even less than doing CT guided transthoracic needle aspiration and it's increasing our yield. So the question is, is where to next? So although the cone beam CT can show you that you're in the lesion, sometimes it's hard to get into the lesion because of the location. Traditionally, biopsying things in the extremes of the upper lobes and also the superior segment has been of the lower lobes has been lower yield. And the reason for that is because of um, the angulation of the airway and the difficulty with getting there with the scope. So one of the main advantages of robotic bronchoscopy is that the scope is smaller and more maneuverable. And because of that, the scope can get out further than a regular traditional bronchoscope. And I think these images here on the top right kind of highlight that well. So this is a conventional bronchoscope trying to get a lesion towards the periphery on the right. And you can see that the robotic broncho uh, bronchoscope is able to get even further to that lesion, almost to the pleura. So this is the left upper lobe lesion. And a traditional bronchoscope really struggles with making that turn up and navigating distally to get to that lung nodule. 
but a robotic bronchoscope, because of its maneuverability, because of its size, is able to almost get to the pleura there also. And the third image shows that again. Same concept, the regular bronchoscope and then the robotic bronchoscope is able to get further and deeper and closer to the lesion. And that's important for multiple reasons. Um, unfortunately, the airway doesn't always go directly to the center of the lymph, uh, excuse me, of the lung nodule. Sometimes it's off to the side. And the advantage of being able to go more distally and have more maneuverability and also stability of the scope is we can angulate and direct our needle and uh, forceps directly at the lung nodule if we're missing it or if we're going off to the side. The other advantage of the stability and the maneuverability of this scope is if in the future, um, if in the future we're able to ablate these lung nodules in the same procedure, it would be very nice to know that you have a stable platform with which to do this. So really ablation will be very highly dependent on it, having the ability to use robotic bronch uh, bronchoscopy and then also cone beam CT on top of it. So kind of changing gears a little bit from lung nodules and lung cancer, I'm gonna talk a little bit about medical thoracoscopy. Medical thoracoscopy I think is poorly understood by most people because most people, including physicians, are more familiar with surgical thoracoscopy. Um, so I think the best way to understand medical thoracoscopy is to compare it a little bit to surgical thoracoscopy. So medical thoracoscopy is performed most commonly in the Bronx suite and it's done under moderate sedation and local anesthesia, while surgical thoracoscopy is done in the operating room and uses general anesthesia and often single lung ventilation. The the technique involves usually one port for a medical thoracoscopy and sometimes two ports. And then for surgical thoracoscopy, they often use multiple ports. So what exactly can medical thoracoscopy offer and do? It's very good at diagnosing uh, exudative effusions of unclear etiology. And it also is good in the same uh, avenue of doing pleural biopsies. You can also perform pleurodesis with this. I'm not saying that it's the same as surgical uh, thoracoscopy, and I think this is important. And um, I'm not saying it can offer the same things, but knowing its role, I think, is uh, a valuable asset. And surgical thoracoscopy can do so much more. You can do lobectomy, segmentectomy, decortication, um, biopsies, wedge biopsies, all of these things. And that's not what medical thoracoscopy is trying to accomplish but it is trying to uh, diagnose effusions and also do pleurodesis. So how exactly does this work? This is the scope, the flexible semi-rigid scope that we use for medical thoracoscopy. And you can see the scope that's very similar to a bronchoscope. And then you can also see the trocars here down on the left. So what you do is basically very similar to a chest tube. You use the triangle of safety and you ultrasound and um, you locate the pleural fluid collection, and then you mark that area. And then after you mark that area, you numb up the area just like you would for a chest tube, and then you access the fluid here and prove that you're in the right spot. And then after you do that, you bluntly dissect down into the pleural fluid and insert the trocar in that space. And then after the trocar is inserted, what you do is you insert the um, the thoroscope and you go into the space and you remove as much of the fluid as you can. And then after you do that, you're left with a good view of the pleura. And the advantage of this is you can see what your, uh, the abnormalities of the pleura and you can biopsy those abnormalities. And medical thoracoscopy is particularly good at diagnosing malignancy and tuberculosis. And this effusion on the bottom in A is related to tuberculosis. So here's a few cases that we've done here at Tulane with medical thoracoscopy. So this gentleman was a young 35 year old male that had an empyema. And you can see these multi-loculated um, fluid collections on his CT. Unfortunately for him, he had a pigtail catheter placed and intrapleural TPA uh, administered through the pigtail catheter but his chest x-ray really did not improve. 
and he had a significant amount of residual effusion. But after um, failure of the pigtail catheter and the TPA, we were able to undergo medical thoracoscopy. And with medical thoracoscopy, we were able to go into the space, we were able to break up adhesions and remove multiple collections of fluid. And then after that procedure, he did quite well. And you can see the difference in the chest x-rays, how much more this right lung is open. After the procedure, we left him with a surgical chest tube in place to drain any residual fluid. And then he got that chest tube out in 24 to 48 hours and was able to go home. Another case we did with medical thoracoscopy was this lady who was a veteran with a pretty complicated uh, history of malignancies. She had a history of colorectal cancer and also endometrial cancer, and then was subsequently noted to have a lung nodule. That lung nodule was eventually diagnosed with cancer, but there wasn't enough cells to determine what the etiology was. She did get treated with radiation, but she recurred. And on her PET scan, after her recurrence, there was this lesion. So um, this is uh, the patient's regular CT, and you can see this left-sided effusion here. And then on the PET scan, you can see this very bright area of PET avidity. And that made us highly suspicious that there was a pleural-based net in this patient. And what we were able to do is bring her in and do a medical thoracoscopy, remove the fluid, and when we remove the fluid, this is the pleural base mass that we saw. And we were able to get good biopsies of this lesion and diagnose her with metastatic endometrial cancer. And the advantage of that is we were able to get enough tissue to also do markers and she was able to get targeted therapy. Um, one more area of interventional pulmonary that I'll throw in at the end. Um, Ramsey talked a little bit about stents. I just want to talk about one more indication for a stent. So this was a gentleman that presented um, actually to University Hospital here. And he had dysphagia, weight loss, and was unable to even swallow liquids. And he was found to have an esophageal mass on his CT of his chest. The other thing you'll notice is a little bit lower than the esophageal mass. This is his right main stem, and this is his left main stem. And you can see this fistula going from the left main stem into his esophagus. He had a, a bronchoesophageal fistula. So this is the bronchoscopic uh, view of this. This is the right main stem and the left main stem with the main carina. And then this is the fistula here in the proximal left main stem going towards the esophagus. And you can see here. And he had very purulent secretions and um, had persistent issues with infections because of this. And what we were able to do is we filled this fistula in with fibrin glue and also some extracellular matrix. And then on top of that, we were able to place a stent. This is a semi-covered stent and it, it basically covers the fistula and allows him to heal and then also decreases the leak from his esophagus to his airways to decrease his infections. And he tolerated this procedure well. So I know that was a lot of information and you kind of got a very broad but rapid tour of interventional pulmonary, but I kind of want to highlight two things at the very end. First of all, interventional pulmonary is a uh, specialty that diagnoses and treats many different forms of lung disease and pleural disease, and it's rapidly evolving. New technology and new techniques are always on the, uh, always in store. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Dr. Becknell, Dr. Abogani. We're at the end of the hour. I, I'm looking to see if there are any questions right now. I don't see any uh, that are listed here. I, I do want to emphasize at this point that, uh, you know, why are we presenting this information at this time? And, and that is because we've been working for the past year on having a thoracic oncology service line uh, here at Tulane, which will involve surgery, radiation oncology. Uh, we have some recent uh, oncologists, uh, Dr. Rivera and now Dr. Sides, that are gonna be involved with this. We are buying the software for the uh, monitoring with the uh, low-dose CT screening. So uh, hopefully by the first quarter of uh, 2020, 
uh, we'll be able to have that in place for you to order on your patients who are at risk. So thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation uh, from both of you and for everyone's time and attention. I look forward to seeing your patients in the Bronx suite. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.